Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is one on stewardship. Now that's an idea that we don't talk very much about in our day. It's entitled Stewardship Motives of the Heart. And this one's entitled Stewards After Eden. It's lesson five in our series for February 3 of 2018. I'd like to challenge you to join us, first of all, in a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, stewardship is something that um, isn't commonly spoken about in our day, but it seems to be something that we need to learn more about. May we learn from this lesson some important truths about how we can be better stewards of yours, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, to be honest, human beings have always been stewards. Adam and Eve were technically stewards in the Garden of Eden. God says, your job is to dress it and keep it and have dominion over it. That's the role of a steward. It wasn't their property, it was God's property, but they were supposed to take care of it. So, right from the beginning, we have been stewards. Um, unfortunately, few people have recognized that responsibility. We think of the people in the Old Testament who didn't want to think about the possibility that they were responsible in some way. They just wanted to experience all the privileges of being God's special people without the responsibilities. So what is stewardship? I guess we probably should start with that. I think um, you've got a few words for us, Carrie. Yes. As with Adam and Eve, God entrusts to us responsibilities of divine origin. Since the fall in Eden, however, the task of stewardship has changed, along with the responsibilities of caring for the material world, we are also entrusted to be good stewards of spiritual truths. And that's a quote from Madoff's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sabbath, January 27 of the new year, not far away. Yeah. Okay. Well, when thinking about stewardship, we usually think of financial and economic issues. But what about stewardships, uh, stewardship of spiritual truths? Are we sharing the good news that we know? How can we do that better? Are we being good stewards? In the Old Testament, the word, the word steward comes from an expression which means upon the house. This would suggest that a steward was responsible for all the activities in a home and I'm sure that uh, those who are very familiar with the biblical text will probably think almost immediately of Joseph and how he was responsible. And Potiphar said, you're responsible for everything here except who? His wife, right? So that gives us a little bit of an idea. So what were the included in the responsibilities of a steward in the Old Testament? Well. It's very clear that, at least in some cases, for example, the story of Joseph, once again, there was a lot of responsibility. I mean, he was in charge of everything. Uh, they were recognized as caring not only not for their own things, but to being, they were caring for the things that belonged to their master. And that's a clear distinction between an owner and a steward. So if the steward took for his own benefit something that belonged to the master and used it for his own benefit, that trust relationship would be broken often, and uh, that would lead sometimes to the dismissal uh, of the steward. And we have some examples of that in the Old Testament as well. Look at Isaiah 22, 14 to 18. Let me make this a little bit more readable here. The Sovereign Lord Almighty himself spoke to me and said, This evil will never be forgiven them as long as they live. I, the Sovereign Lord Almighty, have spoken. The Sovereign Lord Almighty told me to go to Shebna, the manager of the royal household, that would be the steward of the royal household, and say to him, Who do you think you are? What right have you to carve a tomb for yourself out of the rocky hillside? You may be important, but the Lord will pick you up and throw you away. He will pick you up like a ball and throw you into a much larger country. You will die there beside the chariots you were so proud of. You are a disgrace to your master's household. The Lord will remove you from office and bring you down from your high position. That's a pretty serious uh, uh, 
situation. Well, what did he do? He decided to use money from the royal household to build himself a, a royal tomb. Right there beside Jerusalem, outside the gate of Jerusalem. In fact, uh, we're going to read more about that later, so I won't spill the beans right now. Um, Gary, you want to read to us about what a, what a steward does there? A steward identifies himself with, with his master. He accepts the responsibility of a steward, and he must act in a, his master's stead, doing as his master would do where he pre, presiding. His master's interest becomes his. The position of the steward is one of dignity because his master trusts him. If in any wise, if in any wise he acts selfish and, and turns the advantage gained by trading with his lord's goods to his own advantage, he has perverted the trust reposed in him. Very good. So that's from Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 246. So it's just repeating what we said about the, the role of a, of a steward. Well, think about your own personal experiences in the last week. Have you been a faithful steward? Have you correctly represented God to the best of your ability and your various activities? And, you know, thinking not only of your financial and, and, and monetary resources, what are you doing with the spiritual treasure that God has given us? That's probably the most important, isn't it? And which, I mean, it's the most valuable too, yeah. isn't it? But it, it, there's, there's so much hanging on that because it, either you're telling the truth about God or you're misrepresenting Him. Oh. And the way I've uh, thought about it, the greatest evil or the greatest sin that the... Uh, was done was the adversary misrepresenting God. Uh, and you can put a parallel to that of what happened with Moses. Moses, you know, uh, when he struck the rock the second time, misrepresented God. He says, you broke faith with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet he, he was not so stubborn as the adversary was, as Satan was. And so uh, obviously, and then he ended up in heaven. So yeah. God is very forgiving. It's just uh, the way God is. Well, and, and Romans 1 verse 20 suggests that maybe the, one of the worst sins that you can do is misrepresenting God. That's fits, fits yeah. my book. Well, in the New Testament, the word used for steward, we talked about the Old Testament briefly. The, in the New Testament, the word used for steward are two of them. Epitropos, which occurs three times, and oikonomos, which occurs ten times. These words clearly suggest a managerial position. So the New Testament also describes the great accountability of a steward, and there's several passages about that. Jesus told a parable that might teach us something about stewards. Let's just look at that briefly. This is uh, Luke 16. Jesus said to his disciples, There was once a rich man who had a servant who managed his property. The rich man was told that the manager was wasting his master's money, so he called him in and said, What is that I hear about you? Hand in a complete account of your handling of my property because you cannot be my manager any longer. So what would you do? The servant said to himself, my master is going to dismiss me from my job. What shall I do? I'm not strong enough to dig ditches and I'm ashamed to beg. Now I know what I will do. Then when he, my job is gone, I shall have friends who will welcome me in their homes. So he called in all the people who were in debt to his master. He asked the first one, how much do you owe my master? 100 barrels of olive oil, he answered. Here's your count, the manager told him. Sit down and write 50. Then he asked another one, and you, how much do you owe? A thousand sacks of wheat, he answered. Here's your account. The manager told him, write a 800. As a result, the master of this dishonest manager praised him for doing such a shrewd thing because the people of this world are much more shrewd in handling their affairs than the people who belong to the light. Does that sound like a good representation of God? What's going on here? <laughs> really? Not really? So, Jesus goes on to say, So I tell you, make friends for yourselves with worldly wealth, so that when it gives out, you will be welcomed in the eternal home. What does that mean? 
Well, that's the parties being that people are being fired of, right? When you mm -hmm. when you run out of earthly wealth, which is kind of similar to him mm -hmm. losing his job. Yeah. So. Well, he goes on to say, Jesus goes on to say, whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever is dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones. If then you have not been faithful in handling worldly wealth, how can you be trusted with true wealth? Now, would that apply to spiritual wealth as well as financial wealth? And if you've not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will, you give, who will give you what belongs to you? No servant can be the slave of two masters. Such a servant will hate one and love the other, or will loyal, be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. When the Pharisees heard all this, they sneered at Jesus because they loved money. Jesus said to them, you are the ones who make yourselves look right in other people's sight, but God knows your hearts, for the things that are considered of great value by human beings are worth nothing in God's sight. So he's pretty clear about how he regarded all that, wasn't he? What kind of money did they have back then? Uh, the, the money they had was coins, uh, and the coins, they, they, they sometimes used coins from different places. Um, the common money was a shekel. It was, a, I suppose, about a centimeter across, something like that in size, and it had been stamped with a heavy, probably just a, a mallet and a, and a thing, because, of course, silver will, will take uh, an impression. And, and occasionally they had gold coins as well, but not very many and uh, stamp it on both sides. And that's why Jesus, remember, he said, uh, show me the picture on the back, and there's Caesar's picture. And he said, well, okay, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. So the, the value of the metal, was that Basically. The, yeah, it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was supposed to be a precise weight, and that was the value of it. So they, it wasn't really money, money it was commodities. <laughs> Probably, technically, yeah, yeah. Well, look at these words from Paul, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. You should think of us as Christ's servants who have been put in charge of God's secret truths. The one thing required of such servants is that they be faithful to their master. And then Titus 1, 7. For since a church leader is in charge of God's work, he should be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for money. Oh, boy. Do you know anybody that's greedy for money? 1 Peter 4.10, Peter said, Each one is a good manager of God's different gifts, must use for the good of others the, spiritual, the, specific, the special gift he has received from God. So, uh, would it be correct to say in light of that that the, the possessions we have, the talents we have, etc., were given to us by God and are given to us specifically so we can reach out to others. Uh, Dennis, I think you've got the next one there. Yes, this is uh, Alan White from Fundamentals of Christian Education, 301, first paragraph. Shall I open my heart to the Holy Spirit that every faculty and energy may be aroused which God has given me in trust. I am Christ's property and am employed in his service. I am a steward of his grace. That's pretty straightforward, right? Well, look at another passage from Jesus' words. This is Luke 12. I'm going to read from verse 35. Be ready for whatever comes, dress for action, and with your lamps lit, like servants who are waiting for their master to come back from a wedding feast. When he comes and knocks, they will open the door for him at once. How happy are those servants whose master finds them awake and ready when he returns. And he goes on to discuss what God should do with those people who are not ready. So um, that's a pretty serious indictment. Um, how, how, how ready are we for the second coming? Hmm. Don't everybody talk at once here. <laughs> is that our motivation, or is it just to live, live right? Well, whether, whether, I mean, whether God's going to come again, uh, I, well, we have the promises, yeah. but uh, should, shouldn't we do what's right because it's right, not because of a promise of a reward or a threat of punishment? 
Sure. And uh, being concerned whether the Lord's going to return, it doesn't matter. We, if we trust the Lord that he knows how things are really meant to operate, things will be done uh, according to... There will always be a group that, that will do what he wants. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and, and, of course, basically what we're saying here is that that, uh, you know, God expects us to be ready every day, doesn't he? Right, yeah. Think about the man who yeah. built bigger barns and that night he had a heart attack or whatever it was, you know? <laughs> well, Colossians and First Timothy talk about a mystery. What kind of mystery was that? Do you remember? Jesus is the mystery that God wants us to tell everyone about. And the mystery religions of New Testament times, one had to pay a lot of money and go through a lot of training to be allowed to learn the special mysteries. So if you were, you were a member of a mystery religion, you were in the know, okay? So that was, the, that was what mystery meant in those days. So the word mysterion in, in Greek or mystery in English in these passages does not mean what it means in modern language as described in our Bible study guide. It's not something that you know, nobody can figure out. A mystery is something that only the initiated people know. Um, but Paul, and, and there's, Paul does this in a number of places, and I, and always, I always chuckle when I read it, because I know what's behind it. Paul says, I have a mystery. And, oh, really, 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 what's your mystery? And I'm telling everybody. <laughs> so, you know, that's exactly what you're not supposed to do if you know a mystery. Like a secret code or secret yeah, society, exactly. and, and you're what you said, the initiated ones. And, yeah. uh, uh. Well, look at, Way back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 29, 29. There are some things that the Lord our God has kept secret, but he has revealed his law, and we and our descendants are to obey it forever. Now, that was one of the last words from Moses to the children of Israel. Well, let me just ask you another question. Could you be a true steward of something that you don't really understand? You could, you, but it might get you into some trouble. <laughs> you could, know. potentially. Yeah, you know. yeah. Can you think of anybody who was a mystery of something they didn't fully understand in the Bible? Well, I, I think of Daniel. Remember he said, oh, yes. seal up these things yes. until the time of the end? But yet he reported, even though he didn't fully understand it, he reported, didn't he? Yeah. 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 So... There's an example of someone who, who was a steward of something that he didn't really fully understand. Well, think about what the 11 disciples did, who were still left after the crucifixion. Even their enemies said that in one generation, they had turned the world upside down. And they did that walking by foot, maybe sometimes occasionally riding horseback, or going by boat. Paul covered thousands of miles that way. And there was no radio, no television, no internet, no even, not even any regular mail service. And yet, they turned the world upside down. So why couldn't we do that? Can you think of any reason why we shouldn't be able to do that? There's something I've, I've pondered that myself. And while Paul had a lot of enemies, and there was always bandits looking for money, and uh, it's uh, in, in our day and age, and bringing it down into California, I think it's probably similarly across country, you've got to be careful what you say and where you say it, and how much you say it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've got to get a license to do it, or let them know. Yeah. It shouldn't discourage you, but it's, it, the picture's changed a bit. Yeah. Well, and, and I think of Paul's last trip to Jerusalem. He was carrying so much money yes. for the people back in Jerusalem that he had to take a whole bunch of people with him just, just to be safe in his travels. Yeah. Remember, the, the Jews, he, he, was, he, was, he wanted to get onto the boat in, in, from Corinth and take the boat straight to probably to Lebanon or something in those days so he could go straight to the Passover. He started to get on the boat and found out there was Jews on, already on the boat just waiting for him to get on so they could kill him. Mm. So he had to go, he had to get off and start walking around so he couldn't make it to Pentecost, to Passover. He had to aim to get there and he finally made it in time for Pentecost. But I mean, you know, yeah. craziness. Well, 
So why, let, let's ask this question now about stewardship. Why would God leave, talking about the Son now, leave his position of authority, power, and honor in heaven and come down to be born as a baby boy? Uh, be willing to suffer even, I mean, he knew what was coming. Be willing to suffer death, even the death of a common criminal. Short answer, love. God is love. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, keep, yeah. Keep it, keep it simple. Okay, Jim, you want to read us the next comment about? Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death that was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. That's from L.G. White, Desire of Ages, page 25, paragraph 2. So even though we may not be fully able to understand everything, I mean, we don't know what's coming ahead of us. We don't, we have, we read in scriptures about the time of trouble. We read in Ellen White's writings about the time of trouble and some of the things that are coming. But we don't have, we couldn't possibly have a full understanding of what's coming. And that process, of, we have, the question was asked there, really, God, if God is a teacher, mm -hmm. he's a parent, the duty of the parent is to teach so that you can learn something and, and uh, you, you will understand. Use, God uses logic and words to communicate. And uh, yes, we need to keep it in that uh, understanding. Yeah. Well, what is it that we're supposed to teach? What are we supposed to learn from the life and death of Jesus that we can pass on to others? Um, there are a lot of, a lot of suggestions have been made down through the years. Here's an incredibly significant statement from Ellen White, which I'm going to read. It's found in Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions. This is talking about the way things were when Jesus came to this earth. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions, and God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. Now, do we ever hear anybody talking about that kind of language? The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. So who's misrepresenting God's character? Well, the, the religious leaders, but they were representing Satan and, yeah. and attributing that to God. Yeah. So the one who is behind all this, the one who has done everything he possibly can from the beginning to misrepresent God is Satan. So we don't want to join his side and misrepresent God. Jesus came to teach men, so now we're going to find out why Jesus came. And this, the question really is, if this is why he came and this was his work, should it should not also be our work? Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, he was God, could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way in which he could set and keep men right, set would be justification, keep would be sanctification. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Now, think about the implications of that. The only way that he could help us as human beings and represent God to us correctly was, was I mean, the only way he could lead us to salvation is by correctly representing his Father. But th this is in the past, and what we have left is the record of it, and we have to internalize it and then convey it to others because yep. God is not here physically er, er, right. in our presence and uh, God, he, God can't violate our freedom, but he can teach us if we're willing to listen and yeah. take instruction. So she goes on to say, Christ exalted the character of God. Shouldn't we be doing that? Attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose. She said the only way. And now she says the whole purpose of his own mission on the earth 
to set men right through the revelation of God. So does that mean we are justified, we are sanctified by getting to know God better? Sounds like it, doesn't it? And Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And those are all phrases from his prayer in John 17. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. I mean, three times here, she just says, absolutely, his work was to correctly represent God, represent the Father. Does that suggest, and that's Signs of the Times again, January 20, 1890, paragraph 6 and 9, are the ones I focused on. The whole thing is very good, but... Uh, uh, that was John, basically a quote uh, built upon 17.4, yeah. yeah. and 17.3 is, is he tells you that eternal life is to know these yeah. things, so yeah. it keeps it simple. Yeah. So are we correctly representing not only the Son of God, but also God the Father in everything we do and say? Do we ever suggest that his, pour, his wrath is going to be poured out and we think in terms of human wrath? Well, I've, I've heard many uh, expositions of uh, Romans 1. And they start out, they get up to Romans 1, 16, and maybe up to as far as 18. And then they're off to, ch to chapter 3 or 4. Mm -hmm. They don't explain. Right there, you've got in chapter 1 an explanation of what God's wrath is. Yeah. And it's so simple. God lets you do your thing. Okay, mm -hmm. oh, you, you're bent on doing it. God will ultimately let you. He... He's sorry. Yes. Yeah. When, when we when we damage ourselves, but he yeah, he allows us to do that. Well, um, do we have a clear understanding of his God's character of love? Do we comprehend the treasure that God has placed in our hands? I mean, we have. Think about it. We have the Bible. Jim mentioned his Bible there. We have how many translations now in, in English only? Over a thousand. Um, over a thousand of, of at least parts of the New Testament and ma many c copies of the whole Bible that have been translated. So if you don't like the way one says it, you can look at another one. And, and not only that, all the other languages, so many other languages, there have been, I, I think there's a more than a different, more than a thousand different languages now that have been have been, uh, at least portions of the scripture have been put in those languages. Nowadays, for free, you can get a, a Bible program called eSword or mm -hmm. MySword, and the King James, uh, they have many di different translations, mm -hmm. but the King James has, uh, I think it's called the King James Plus, has all the uh, Greek words and the Hebrew words with the Strong's number, mm -hmm. and you can see many a different, you can make, ultimately, you can make up your own translation. For free, yeah. and for free, it's not, it doesn't have to cost you an arm or leg. Yeah. It just takes a, a commitment on your part to to do so. Yeah. So, and what are we doing with all the writings of Ellen White? How many? How you know? I I don't know whether I should say this or not, but I have been some places in the world where I've asked people, how many uh, Adventist audiences? How many of you have read an entire book of the Bible? Just one book, all the way through. Probably none. Virtually nobody. And how can we? How can we say that our our main responsibility is to represent God correctly if we, we haven't even read one book of the Bible through? I mean, not the Gospels even. Well, I I learned some time ago that the uh, ministerial students at uh, the seminary. They use a volume called Systematic Theology. <laughs> and it has really no gospel in it. It's just a, it's a false approach to, uh, to theology. And, uh, but you cripple these young men, mostly young men, and uh, obviously they've got to try to make a living, and their theology is based upon a, a, a false premise. Yeah, well, and once again, let's just be very specific. We're suggesting that the intangible treasures, the, the Bible we've been talking about, the writings of Ellen White and so forth, these are of far more value than any of our financial possessions or our homes, our cars, or whatever we happen to have. Uh, 
those things pale in significance as compared to basically the keys to the kingdom of God. And you can get all of that online for free. Yep. And you're running in out many of different languages. Yeah, without a, a, you can get it in audio format. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 a great treasure that's out there for yep. people. Well, remember in Ephesians six, uh, I'm just going to jump over there real quick. What God says: We are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. So, who are the cosmic powers? Wicked angels. Have to be wicked angels. So put on God's armor now. Then when that evil day comes, you will be able to resist the enemy's attacks, and after fighting to the end, you will still hold your ground. So you know what these verses say. That, so implies, that implies that, God, uh, they talked about God's armor. Uh, that's part of God's protection yeah. plan. Uh, God, God has always provided a, a, a opportunity for protection if, if you were willing to listen and take instruction. Mm -hmm. So stand ready with the truth of, as a belt tight round your waist, with righteousness as your breastplate, and as your shoes the readiness to announce the, God, the good news of peace. There have been some interesting sermons on why these different things are called these different things, but unfortunately we don't have time to talk about that now. At all times, carry faith as a shield, for with it you will be able to put out all the burning arrows shot by the evil one. Wow and accept salvation as a helmet, and the Word of God is a sword which the Spirit gives you." So, you're, you're all set if you got all that. So, um, God expects us to fight these, mil to use these military items appropriately. We are to be constantly fighting the good fight of faith. What is the good fight of faith? Well, we, we, can't, we can't fight the good fight of faith if we, if we don't know God, because faith is a word we use to describe a relationship with God. So the good fight of faith is not punching somebody in the nose. The good fight of faith means, how can I get to know God better? And there's a word, another comment from Ellen White about that, uh, Carrie. Only in the light that shines from Calvary can nature's teaching be read aright. Through the story of Bethlehem and the cross, let it be shown how good is to hang on a minute. Shown how good it is to conquer evil, and how every blessing that comes to us is a gift of redemption. Yeah. Okay. So the yeah. devil cannot defeat us unless we allow him to do so. So long as we are fighting faithfully against him with the Holy Spirit's help, we are invincible. Uh, you've heard people say things like. The Holy Spirit plus one is a majority. But that requires constant vigilance on our part in obeying the truth, exercising our faith, and coming to know God better each day. Only by taking up our crosses and bearing witness to the truth about God, as Jesus did, can we truly put on and continue to depend on God's armor. And I would use an expression that's being used now fairly often, use it or lose it. Yeah, if you're not constantly renewing your familiarity with God's Word, you know, you're going to lose it. Well, do we sometimes think that spreading the gospel is the minister's responsibility? How many Adventists think that, well, the pastor's been trained with all that theological training and so forth. That, that's his job, right? Have we seriously thought of the idea that we might, be, might personally be responsible in some way or another? Are we using God's gifts and His treasures appropriately? Gary, I think you have some words about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. God desires to bring men into direct relation with Himself. In all His dealings with human beings, He recognizes the principle of personal responsibility. He seeks to encourage a sense of personal dependence and to impress the need of personal guidance. His gifts are committed to men as individuals. Every man has been made a steward of sacred trust. Each is to dis 
discharge his trust according to the direction of the giver and by each in account of his stewardship must be rendered to God. And that's pretty serious talk, isn't it? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7. How many people are responsible for what God has given them? Everyone. Everyone. This is not just the pastor's work. And if, if 11 men, with obviously some other helpers, could manage to turn the world upside down in their day, I mean, how many people would it take to do that today? I mean, are we just completely incapable of somehow or other impacting our world? So taking personal responsibility means that we do not blame others when things do not go well. And, and, and think, about, think about Adam and Eve. God speaks to Adam, well, what happened here? Oh, well, the woman you gave me. Goes to Eve. Well, but the serpent that, serpent that you made, you know? They're already blaming other people right at the very beginning. Well, Daniel's friends made it very clear about how they felt about responsibility. Look at Daniel 3, uh, verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, Your Majesty, we will not tr try to defend ourselves. Excuse me. If the God whom we serve is able to save us from the blazing furnace and from your power, then he will. But even if he doesn't, your majesty may be sure that we will not worship your God and we will not bow down to the gold statue that you have set up. And what was the response? Was Nebuchadnezzar was furious, wasn't he? In the furnace. And got, they got thrown into the furnace. And what happened there? Ranked up the power. <laughs> they, they got it as hot as they could get it, and then what happened? Here are these guys walking around in there with Jesus, right? Yeah. Well, one of the great conundrums in the Christian faith is the idea that we are saved by faith, but judged by our works. Now, how does that, how does that go together? Look at a couple of passages. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10, for example. For all of us must appear before Christ to be judged by Him. We will each receive what we deserve according to everything we have done, good or bad, in our bodily life. And that's pretty clear, right? Yeah. Well, look at Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead, death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held, and all were judged according to what they had done. Are we prepared for that? Well, I well, think we're judged according to our works uh, in reference to what Scripture calls the, the reward. Mm -hmm. Behold, my reward is with me to give to me, each man according to his works. In uh, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says that no man can lay a foundation <coughs> other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So mm -hmm. th that's the faith part of that. Mm -hmm. And then it says, now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's will, work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Yeah. So there's this um, sense, as Paul says in Galatians, uh, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever mm -hmm. a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yeah. So whether your spirit is sowing to the flesh or the spirit, um, so there's, there's, uh, there's both elements there. Okay. Well, are we responsible for actions? If we are responsible for our actions, then we must have free will. Mm -hmm. A God of love would never hold us responsible for something over which we have no control. Well, often in biblical times, the steward actually lived with his master. They, you know, you actually lived with the person that you were serving. 
In that context, it was sometimes easy for a steward to gradually come to think that his master's possessions were, were basically his. He could do what he wanted with them. So, Dennis, what does uh, our SDA book, handbook of theology say about that? The New Testament takes Old Testament ideas and joins them with first century ideas, concepts, and words, thus enriching and enlarging the biblical teaching on stewardship. The most common Greek words used in relationship with stewardship are derived from uh, oikos and oikia. Is that close enough? Mm -hmm. um, or house. The oik Oikonomos. Oikonomos is one who keeps the house, the steward or manager. Oikonomia is the abstract noun, management of the house, the meaning of which is often much broader. Yeah. And you probably recognize in that reading that, that word oikonomia, that's where we get our word economy. So we talk about the economy of the nation's economy and so forth. That's, the, that's where that word came from. So what was Adam's first responsibility when God pointed out his lack of response, first response, when God pointed out his lack of responsibility? We've already mentioned that uh, he jumped immediately to start blaming his wife. Yes. Well, God has entrusted us with more spiritual treasure in terms of the Bible and the writings of Ellen White than any other human group in history. I mean, think about Paul even, for example. How much, how much of the scripture was he able to carry around with him all the time? Well, there's a possibility that he memorized the Old Testament in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Scholars back in those days, a number of them did. So it's quite likely he did. But other than the stuff he had in his mind, I mean, how many big old scrolls could you carry around on all those journeys he was on? Not many. He did have some, though, apparently. He did have some. Remember, at the very end, he, he told, he told was it Timothy or Mark? He says, please bring my dock and my scrolls and so forth. Yeah. Bring them here. I, I want them here in Rome so I can work with them. So, yeah, he apparently owned some and, and traveled with them when he could. Well, Seventh-day Adventists believe that our special message for the world is the message of? Three angels' message. The three angels' messages. How many Seventh-day Adventists can correctly explain Revelation 14, 6 to 12, so as to give a correct picture of God, a picture of love? Have you ever tried to read the third angel's message and tell people how loving God is? I don't think too many of us have. <laughs> Not too many of us have. The truth is, in order to correctly understand the three angels' messages, you have to understand the rest of the Bible before you get there. If you understand God's wrath, if you understand the fire, if you understand the gospel, etc., then you can put it together in a way that's meaningful and not inconsistent with the God of love. Well, it's so easy for church members to think that because they do not have theological training, spreading the gospel should be left to the pastor. We need to recognize that just as every scientific field is constantly being expanded to include new information, a correct understanding of present truth. Do we have present truth? Or we have truth that's a couple hundred years old, at least. Well, we talk about present truth, don't we? I think it depends a bit on who you're talking to and at what level. You don't have to really get into the more involved stuff right off. In fact, that could hurt you sometimes. You've got to keep it simple. I worked as a call porter one summer. When I was in college, and um, we were told a story that I, I, I will never forget. It was a story about a man who lived down in Texas, an elderly man who was blind. Well, pretty much blind. I guess he, was, he could see enough to sort of work his way down the street, but he was pretty much blind. And he had himself an old, tattered copy of Great Controversy. And he, would, he would go from house to house, and would go up, and he said, knock on the door. This was in the days when it was a little easier to do that than it is now. Yes. He would say, you know, I'm almost blind and I can't read my book here. Would you be willing to read me a chapter out of this book? And guess who was the biggest soul winner in that church? He was. <laughs> he was by far. You know, and he would just, he would ask people to read it. What do you think that means? Why does, why does it say that? Da, da, da. 
and immediate, almost immediately, you, how, I mean, how could you argue? I mean, there it is, you read it, you know, and he starts asking questions about it. Fantastic. And so what, it, what skills did he have? Uh, the only skill he had was he was bold enough to do it. Yeah. We need to recognize that just as every scientific field, I've already mentioned that, every one of us has available the resources needed to understand as far as possible the mystery of Christ. Um, 1 Thessalonians 2.4 tells us, Instead, we always speak as God wants us to because he, had, he has judged us worthy to be entrusted with the good news. We do not try to please people, but to please God who tests our motives. So he's judged us worthy to be entrusted with what? The good news. What does that mean? God is love. Yeah. Do we understand the implication? Remember, we're talking about being stewards here. Do we understand the implication of the fact that here we have these Bibles, here we have the writings of Ellen White. How are we representing those to the people that we come in contact every, with every day? What's the best way for Adventists to witness to the world? Have you ever asked yourself, what would Paul or Jesus do if they lived today in our community? Well, Ellen White outlines Christ's method, you know, coming close, meeting their needs, and then bidding them uh, to follow him. So mm -hmm. uh, we have to get close to the people. We have to uh, gain their confidence and minister to their needs and to the extent that we can, and then, um, then bring Christ to them as well. Yeah. Well, officially, we as Seventh Adventists have 28 key doctrines. How many of those doctrines would you be willing to die for? Are you you're willing to die for Jesus, not for conceptual well, truths, ideas? Um, you know. Yeah. How many of those truths would you be? I can tell you a story about someone I know that um, was was a pastor. He heard a knock on the door in the middle of the night. Went to the door, opened the door. And a man immediately forced his way into his house with a gun. And he said, I want you to get your family out here and line them up by the wall here. So he called, got his family, woke his family up, his wife, and I think he had two children, lined them up on the wall. And the man says, now I'm going to ask you some questions. He's pointing the gun at, his, at the pastor. He says, do you believe in God? Do you believe, that Jesus, do you believe in Jesus? Do you think he's coming back again? A few questions like that. And so when he finished asking his questions. Now he says, okay. He put the gun right to the head of the pastor like this, and he said, now I'm going to ask you the same questions I just asked you, and the first time you say yes, I'm going to pull the trigger. Now what would you do? If you really believed it, you'd repeat it. <laughs> well, he said, he said, do you believe in God? And the pastor said, yes. And the man looked at him for a second and threw his gun across the room. He said, I didn't think there was anyone left in this world who really believed anything. I received some mail a couple of times in the last month, people looking for donations. And on the side of the envelope, in an outline, it's got a Christian, I think they're on their knees, and there's one of these, we know who, with an AK-47 and said every night, something to the word that every night a Christian is going to be shot. Mm -hmm. We know that's what's oh, happening. More often than that. Oh yeah, but I mean it was, it yeah. caught your attention. Mm -hmm. a and I think we don't need to rush around and, and hit people with the, uh, what's the word I want, uh, the list that you mentioned yeah. straight off. Yeah. I had an experience uh, on a night shift in mental health unit many years ago, and it was quiet, dead quiet, which is unusual for an admission unit, as you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it was a co-ed unit, and I, I had a female trainee, and I, I was a senior man, and she said, I, I see you don't smoke. And it started it rolling. Mm -hmm. And one thing, thing led to another. We spent most of the night actually going 
not I didn't have a Bible with me, but I illustrated through. I said, "You're reading the Gospels of the New Testament. Christ did this, and he did mm. that, and he advises do this." And she brought up. I don't think she'd had any Bible background, and she said, "I've never heard anything like that before. You just mm. have to play it by what you're dealing with." Yeah, you be, need to be prepared. Yeah. Well, are we prepared in every aspect of our lives, even in our life life itself? Recognize that even our life itself is a gift of God to be used for His honor and glory? Do we find it hard to witness to family or friends? Despite the fact that they may not initially respond as you wish, they would, do you keep trying? What can we do to make the truth seem more appealing? Wouldn't that be a worthwhile thing to do? Maybe, maybe stop misrepresenting because truth is, is, is as appealing as it can, be, can possibly be. The better, the more truth you find out about God, the better God looks. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Yeah. So the more thankful and rejoicing we are, the more appealing. Yeah. Well, the truth has been passed down from generation to generation. Some generations there have been relatively few people really standing for the truth. And now it's our turn. We have it. Do we want to just try to preserve it carefully like the guy who buried the one talent in the dirt and so we can pass it on to the next generation? Or do we want to spread it so we can finish the gospel? Well, the word steward is not often used in modern speech. We do not have slaves or stewards per se under normal circumstances. So what modern words would be the equivalent of a steward? Employee, manager, chief executive officer, manager, supervisor, guardian, accountant, chief financial officer, who knows. Well, to get an overall view of Old and New Testament aspects of the steward's life, review, and there's a whole list of texts, and these, these handouts that we use are available to you um, on the website at Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, T H E O X dot O R G. You can look them up there, and there's we don't have time to read all the verses. We've already talked about the story of Shebna, who misused his master's money to build himself a fancy gravesite. And uh, Jim, I think you've got to read to us about that. What's been found about that gravesite? The rock-hewn sepulchers of the type of of the type Shebna was constructed for himself are common to the environs of Jerusalem. Professor N. Avagod was, has identified this tomb of Shebna with one of, on the slopes of the Mount of Olives discovered many years ago and from which an inscription was taken to the British Museum. This inscription, which defied decipherment for many years, reads, This is the sepulcher of Shebna, Yahoo, who is over the house, who is over the house. There is no silver or gold there or here, but his bones and the bones of his slave wife with him. Cursed be the man who will open this, that is yeah. in brackets. Uh, and the rest of that's sort of broken off. So there's a, uh, you have to, there's a, those there's really a ancient, yeah, those yeah. really ancient things, very often they've been chipped or pieces yeah. are broken away, and so you just sort of, so the rest of it you can't read. But they've actually found that piece, and it's in the British Museum, the piece where it says, this is, this is the, 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 the grave site of Shebna with his wife. Well, ultimately, especially in the New Testament times, the steward was considered to be the one responsible for making everything in the household run in order. The two words, epitropos and otomonos, are both found in Galatians 4 2, if you want to look some examples. Paul used these words to describe our personal responsibility for spiritual matters. And summing up with we have, what we have learned in this lesson, which is, more, which is more valuable, one, our personal material possessions which God has given us, or the spiritual truths that God has given us. Which of these two prepares us for a life in eternity with Jesus Christ our Lord? Try to imagine everything Paul went through in trying to spread the gospel. Consider these words in 2 Corinthians 11. Unbelievable. I'm going to read it from the Message Bible. These are Paul's words to the people who are questioning his authenticity. I worked much harder, been jailed more often, beaten up more times than I can count, and at death's door time after time. 
I've been flogged five times with the Jews' 39 lashes, beaten by the Roman rods three times, and pummeled with rocks once. I've been shipwrecked three times. Now, this is before the shipwreck that we know about in the book of Acts. I've been shipwrecked three times and immersed in the open sea for a night and a day. And hard traveling year in and year out, I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city, at risk in the country, endangered by desert sun and sea storm, and betrayed by those I thought were my brothers. I've known drudgery and hard labor, many a lot and long and lonely night, without sleep, many a missed deep meal, blasted by the cold, naked to the weather, and that's not the half of it. When you throw in the daily pressures and anxieties of all the churches, when someone gets to the end of his rope, I feel the desperation in my bones. When someone is duped into sin, an angry fire burns in my gut. If I have to brag about myself, I'll brag about the humiliations that make me like Jesus. The eternal and blessed God and Father of our Master Jesus knows I'm not lying. Remember the time I was in Damascus and the governor of uh, of King Aretas posted guards at the city gates to arrest me. I crawled through a window in the wall, was let down in a basket, and had to run for my life. Wow. So, uh, anyone feel like you have a story like Paul's? I think considering the times he was living in, wow. there's no such thing as penicillin, coast guard, or whatever, but it's obvious God was looking after him. For even sure. Even though he got roughed up pretty badly. Yeah. So once again, I ask the final question to all of you out there. Should we feel personally responsible for souls that could have been lost or could be lost? Think of what God and Christ has done for us. We could never begin to repay. But what is a responsible expectation that God might have of us? Do you know any modern Christians who have the same fervor that Paul had for the gospel? Paul said that we are on our own. We have been bought with, we are not our own, I'm sorry. We have been bought with a price. Do you recognize that in your personal experience? Do you act accordingly? You're a steward. We're all stewards of the blessings and the talents and the money and the possessions that we have. What are we doing with them? Are we correctly representing God? Our kind and wonderful Father, it's a great privilege to represent you correctly as far as we are able. We think of the fact that Jesus came and his whole mission was to try to represent you correctly. Could we follow his example? We can ask those maybe worn out words now, what would Jesus do? May we ask those questions in each aspect of our own lives each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.